be shy if you sit in the front. This is the Sunday church. Sitting in for this one? Uh, yeah, I Or voodoo, or 
hoodoo or the otherwise supernatural that are intertwined throughout the story for dramatic effect. Do we find such themes in southern video games? Yeah, we do. Well, yes and no. Some of these so-called southern video games uh, do, in, do in fact explore these same literary themes that we find in southern novels. While others, well, they just happen to take place in the South because, well, the South is, uh, the South is cool, right? Well, they might, these things might take place in the South because of the stuff that the South has that's different from the rest of the United States. Southern architecture, the geography of the South, the wildlife, the ghosts of the South. And what I'm going to show you next is uh, a little bit of, it's not a complete rundown of all southern video games. Just a sampling of games that you may or may not have heard of. Some of you may have heard of them and be like, oh yeah, I forgot all about that game. And I know I'm going to leave off some of your favorite games that might have a southern set. I'm, I'm well aware that Left 4 Dead 2 has a stage based right here in, in Savannah. Okay. So having said that, let's move on to some examples that, you're, that you may uh, not be familiar with. One of the first, I don't know, you, you call it a video game, it's, a, it's a, a text adventure game. Anybody ever play text adventures? Okay, a few of you. Who's heard of Colossal Cave Adventure? Well, you might have known it by its, uh, by its other name, just Adventure, or some people just called it Advent. This was the first text adventure game that is considered the precursor for the adventure game genre. And why I've included it here is because the cave structure that you explore, the network of caves that you explore in Colossal Cave Adventures, is uh, patterned loosely on Mammoth Cave in Kentucky. The game has enjoyed some, a, a bit of a resurgence in popularity as of late. Anybody here watch Halts and Catch Fire on AMC? One of you. Okay. Well, if you haven't seen Halt and Catch Fire, at least go to the website. Go to the homepage for Halt and Catch Fire. You can actually play a in-browser version of Colossal Cave Adventure, and it actually figures into some of the key plot points in the in the TV show. So you can play it in your browser, and it can feel like 1983 all over again, for better or worse. Fast forward a few years to the heyday of point-and-click adventure games that were produced by Sierra Online, best known for King's Quest, Space Quest, Police Quest, and of course, Leisure Suit Larry. <laughs> One of these games, The Colonel's The Quest, takes place in mid-1920s New Orleans, and you play the role of Laura, Bo, or Val, I've only seen it in text, nobody's ever pronounced it for him, but let's call it Laura Bo, B-O-W, uh, who's a student at Tulane University, and she joins her, her flapper girlfriend to solve an Agatha Christie-style mystery. Most people here, I think, are probably familiar with The Walking Dead, or perhaps the comic book on which it is based. There's, uh, there's several video games that are based on The Walking Dead, but uh, the one that probably most people are familiar with is the, the Telltale adventure game uh, that is uh, based on both the TV show and the comic. Telltale, uh, they specialize in these choice, uh, choice and consequence type games. So as you engage in dialogue with some of the characters in the game, the choices you make can actually have an effect on how the narrative plays out. I like the TV show and the comic, the video game version of The Walking Dead takes place in Georgia, where your characters are just trying to make their way from Atlanta to Macon, and then finally to, in, to Savannah in, uh, let's just say, hope of a better life, at least, to escape a zombie infestation. They wonder, why does this game, why does The Walking Dead itself take place in Georgia? You could have a zombie infestation anywhere, right? Of course you could, right? It happens every day. Well, let me quote Robert Kirkman, the creator of The Walking Dead. He said, when asked why Georgia, why Atlanta, he said, I didn't want New York, LA, or an urban setting. I didn't want a super cop, the president, a CIA guy involved. I wanted ordinary people at the center, in the thick of it, just trying to survive, 
turn again by and do right by their family. That sounds a bit like Southern literature to me. Sounds a little Southern Gothic as well. Nancy Drew goes to Thornton Hall. Another point and click adventure that uh, uh, with locations inspired by the islands of, of Georgia. And uh, what you're looking at here is, is actually not something from Georgia. Well, it takes place in this fictitious Black Rock Island. But the, uh, the setting you see here is essentially a replica of uh, Oak Allen Plantation, which is in St. James Parish, Louisiana. If you're, if you're into the whole Twin Peaks thing, you might like Virginia. This is a so-called walking simulator slash crime thriller. There's actually no spoken dialogue at all in this game, Virginia. And, uh, and the story is told through decidedly David Lynch, David Lynchian uh, narrative, with a lot of, I think they're called smash cuts that are kind of disorienting in terms of, of how the narrative plays out. Bit of a polarizing game, I think. If, uh, if cute and fun platforming and puzzle solving is more your you might like Voodoo Vince. Uh, this was a game that came out for the original Xbox way back in 2003, and uh, unless you had an original Xbox, there was, no way you could, there was no, other, no other way to play the game for several years. It was one of the few Xbox, original Xbox games that wasn't compatible with the Xbox 360. Uh, but fortunately, and for whatever reason, just this past year it was remastered for Xbox One and for uh, Windows. So this is a 3D platforming adventure through New Orleans. You play the role of, a little hard to see, but that's Vince. A, uh, I say anthropomorphic, but well, yeah. a living anthropomorphic voodoo doll who's on a quest to save his caretaker, owner, Marie, uh, Madame Charmaine, who may or may not be patterned after the famous Marie Laveau, the voodoo practitioner that uh, some people are aware of in New Orleans. Resident Evil 7 Biohazard. The game finally lives up to the series name in the sense that there's a house with residents who are evil. In this case, you face off against a crazy family in a rundown Louisiana plantation house. The last game I'll mention in my short list of, of Southern games, games influenced by the South, or at least take place in the South, is Kentucky Route Zero. Raise your hand if you've heard of this one. Okay, a few of you. Y'all need to play this game. If you're, a number of you raise your hand uh, when you say you're familiar with Southern literature, if you're at all into the Southern Gothic style of storytelling, you would really like this game. This is a Southern Gothic tale uh, brought to life in, a, in, a, in an interactive video game form. There's not a whole lot of action, not a whole lot of puzzle solving. You're just controlling these characters and just trying to make their way through a series of bad situations. Again, pulling yourselves up by your bootstraps just to carry on. And there's uh, five acts to this game. Acts one through four have been released, and, uh, and act five is supposedly coming soon. But please check this game out. There's, there's nothing like it. Uh, the, the scene you're seeing here now is uh, you and your party are, are hanging out at, uh, at some pub called the Lower Decks, and you're watching a, a band that's just struggling to make it sing a song and it's actually quite beautiful and haunting at the same time. How about our neighbors across the river? Our neighbor across the river. Well, there's not much. <laughs> According to Wikipedia, you've got Tiger Woods Golf, PGA Tour 2007, and SimCity 2000. And evidently, there are people who do revisit this page. Last well, edited July 2016. Some people might view this as a disappointment. I view this as an opportunity. Find a need and fill it. It's one of my mottos. Interestingly enough, I didn't plan for this, but I actually got a Charlie horse putting on a sock today and ready to say, I was thinking, you know what, I could probably use that sock slider that was. Uh, meant to be a joke. So, as it happens, I have not one but two video games, southern video games in the works. Uh, two games based on the folklore and history of the South Carolina Low Country. 
But they're kind of the same game, actually. Um, or at least they exist in the same universe, narratively speaking. But let me tell you how that, how all that got started. I was, um, so I've been a professor of computational science at University of South Carolina, if you've heard for USCD for short, uh, for going on seven and a half years now. And um, so I, I started there in 2011, and I, I, got, I got the job offer in 20, late 2010, and I was finishing up my dissertation in computational biology at uh, Penn State. And I was thinking, okay, I need to learn about this place where I'm going to be moving to. And so if you, uh, after a couple of Google searches, I came across this map of the United States that asks, what is coming to get us? And it's basically, what does everybody fear the most in each state? So we look at Texas, there's cannibals. In Ohio, it's dreams. Pennsylvania, it's zombies. In North Carolina, it's caves, but in South Carolina, look what we got here. Two words. Boo hag. Not even the boo hag, just the boo hag. As soon as I saw that, I'm like, okay, I'm officially intrigued. So what's a boo hag? Well, one Google search led to another, and uh, before long I have developed a bit of an obsession with learning about what a boo hag was, what low country voodoo was, or some people call it voodoo. Learned about the rivalry between the Beaver County's longtime sheriff, Ed McTeer, practice his own brand of witchcraft to combat his nemesis, Dr. Buzzard, who, if you're from Savannah, you're, you're familiar with the story of Minerva from Midnight in the Garden of Good and Evil. Minerva was the common law wife of Dr. Buzzard, or at least somebody who met, at least went by the name Dr. Buzzard. And, and so Ed McTierra and, Ed McTierra and Dr. Buzzard had a rivalry in terms of root work and conjuration. And of course, there are various interpretations of Gala stories about paints and hags, how locals would put paint, blue paint, on their houses to keep the hag from getting inside and riding them and suffocating them. Now, over the years, here and there, we made progress on what eventually came to be known as bugs and boo hags, and uh, and I worked on that with my girlfriend Candace Brasser, who's who's a uh, my project manager, de facto project manager, and she's with me here now. And she and I uh, had the good fortune of being accepted into Pax Rising and Pax South a couple years ago, and, and we showcased uh, our first prototype level of, of bugs and boohags there to, to a very warm reception. Pax, if you're not familiar with it, stands for Penny Arcade Expo. It's a series of video game conventions that uh, occur annually in Seattle, Boston, Melbourne, Australia, and most recently San Antonio. Pax Rising is, uh, was a curated group of 10 up-and-coming independent game development teams that are selected for each Pax event and given their own little, I don't want to call it a mega booth, but there were, there were 10 of us in, in this uh, separated off area, not separated off, it was intended to actually uh, enable greater foot traffic and, and there was more um, media coverage in that section of the, of the uh, show floor than necessarily for elsewhere on, uh, at Pax. Well, let me give you an example of some of the media coverage that we got. Hey folks, it's me, Screaming Sammy Scratch, the King of Scratch Band, coming at you once again from Axe 2016. We are talking about bugs and boo hacks. What does that mean? So, Bugs and Boo Hacks is a, is a hybrid tower defense platform type of game that's meant to be a throwback to games of the early 80s like Donkey Kong Jr., Burger Time, with a little bit of Plants vs. Zombies thrown in for, to, make, to give it a little bit of a pretty diverse twist. collection of different gameplay elements. Exactly, exactly. But it's meant to be like the, those hard games that you had to keep pumping quarters into back sure. from the early 80s, like when you go to Pizza Hut and 7-Eleven and spend just you know, you know hours just trying to make your way through like the first level of Donkey Kong. So it is intended to be a little bit difficult, but the game itself is influenced by where I'm from, which is Beaufort, South Carolina. I'm a professor at the University of South Carolina Beaufort in their computational science department, and I have been teaching their programming classes for several years now. This is my first actual game that I'm trying to get out for commercial release, and everything about the game is influenced in some way by something about Beaufort or that area of South Carolina, from the look and feel of the 
the live oak trees with Spanish moss hanging off them to palmetto trees that you can climb up as if they were like ladders. Um, what, what, why focus on, on a town like a different? Do you just like it? Was there? It's really like because people that it's the town itself has a really good vibe. It's a neat little quirky little seaside town. Um, but the, but the real neat thing is like there's this. Some people still hold on, hold on to their beliefs in witchcraft and voodoo. And the Gullah people on St. Helena Island, which is very close to Beaufort, um, they were the descendants of the freed slaves from the beginning of the Civil War. And they used to tell stories to try to explain everyday things, um, like, like bad things that would happen to people. And, and so they would come up with these cautionary tales for why things happen. And so if you've ever had sleep paralysis, if you wake up in the middle of the night and you feel like you know somebody's like riding on top of your chest and you can't breathe, it's kind of like a waking nightmare kind of a thing, they believe that that's the boo hack doing it to you. The boo hack is kind of like a female boogeyman. Oh, all right, by, by day, she, she looks like a normal woman. Like it could be, you, you could very well be married to this woman, for all you know. And, and she takes off her skin at night, spins it onto a loom, and uh, and then she goes around, and just starts floating around the town to see what houses she can get into, and then ride the ride this people sleeping inside, and basically take their life force away. And, and so that, that's why you wake up feeling suffocated and out of breath. So they believe the boohag's doing that to you, but you're not. You can defend your home against the boo hack with various means, and uh, including painting all the doors and windows this certain shade of blue, which we call paint blue. So if you actually to go to some homes in South Carolina and, and uh, that part of Georgia nearby, uh, you'll see some houses that actually have that blue paint on their windows and doors. Other things you can do as sort of tactical items to use in the game, this is still based on the actual mythology. Um, you can put a broom in front of a hag, and she'll pick it up and start counting all the bristles obsessively. You can shake, because she doesn't have any skin, you can shake salt on the hag, and that's, uh, and it's like rubbing salt into a wound, so she'll be writhing and acting up for a few seconds. What do the bugs have to do with it? The bugs are everything, like, those are just those nuisance bugs that everybody in South Carolina is familiar with. Mosquitoes, fire ants, and uh, cockroaches, which we call pal palmetto bugs, because I guess that's a classier name, we're the palmetto state, so. Um, but yeah, so the game itself involves having to just grab cans of paint, paint the doors and windows as quickly as you can before the hags show up. And if you can protect your house, the hags are going to start coming after you and you just got to keep them out until sunrise. When the sun rises, if the hag is caught outside, and this again is still influenced by the actual superstitious beliefs, she'll burn up in the morning sun and then you'll have saved the day. So that's bugs and goo hags in, well, in a three minute nutshell as a uh, as uh, gratefully covered by Sam Sketch from WASD Radio. Uh, so apart from what you saw and heard in the video, um, there were a number of other, there were a number of local and regional influences on, on the game's design. So you probably caught a couple of these, the live oak trees and, and uh, palmetto trees. Um, the Spanish moss hanging off, I used those to create effectively a ladder, okay? And, and uh, ladders could also be made out of the broken off uh, uh, fronds of, of the palmetto tree. So if it looks like a ladder, you can probably climb on this. So that's how I interjected the ladder, the ladder mechanic, ladder climbing mechanic into this game. It's meant to kind of be a throwback to the old uh, single screen platformer games of, of the mid 80s that, uh, that many of you might uh, remember. Donkey Kong, Burger Time, uh, things, things from that era. So Bob's and Hacks was intended to be as much a love letter to that era uh, of video gaming that you know, was kind of my golden age of, of arcade games, and uh, as well as the South Carolina low country in terms of the the, uh, the scenery as well as the architecture and the um, well just everything that you find here uh, finds its way into the video game in some way, right? So Spanish moss hanging off of live oaks and uh, and a little bit you know if you look carefully you can see the palm and and crescent of the South Carolina. Flag there buried into the uh, into the background scenery as well. Many of the levels in the game are based on home designs from a from an architect in Newford who was kind enough to license, I guess you could say license, let me use uh, his uh, des designs for free. So Allison Ramsey, that's not a person, uh, that's a Mr. Allison and a Mr. Ramsey, uh, Cooter Ramsey, uh, is uh, he's based in. in well, Allison Ramsey himself is based in Newport, and I popped into their office uh, one day and asked for you know, forgiveness rather than permission. I had already you know, developed the game, and I said, hey, do you mind if I you know, use more of your house designs in the game? They were all about it, so, um, or at least Cooter was. 
And so here are some of the designs that, uh, that you can get right off their website. What I really like about this is you know, the two-dimensional representation of, of their design is not an orthographic projection or anything like that. And that made it really easy to translate into uh, pixel art. Okay, so these are the pixel art representations of those three home designs from Alice and Ramsey Architects. But it's not just newer homes. Okay, it's not just like those homes that you might find in Habersham and Newpoint and, and some of these other planned communities that you'll find in the Low Country, but also historically significant homes. Homes like this. Anybody know what this is? Anybody seen the Big Chill? Okay, with the Great Santini. Okay, well this is the Big Chill House, also known as the Edgar Frick House, uh, commonly known by, I guess it's nickname, title home, T-I-D-A-L-H-O-L-M. Uh, but you know it's just commonly known around town as the movie house, and uh, a lot of people you know drive down the one way, the dead end street to you know try to get a glimpse of, of the house. It's not a very good view. But uh, yeah, Title Home makes its way into uh, Bugs and Boo Hacks. This uh, probably is one of the later levels, just because there's so many doors and windows that uh, your character has to cover with paint to keep the boo hag out. So this might very well be the nightmare level. But there's going to be a number of uh, historically significant homes that make their way into the into the game. Uh, some of them are historically significant because they're, not, they're probably not going to be around for very much longer. Okay, Title Home will be around forever. There will always be somebody you know, interested in the preservation of, of that house and other houses in the old point section of Beaufort. But some, uh, some locations in Beaufort are, you know, they, they don't look so good right now. But they're really fascinating. If you've ever been on the Spanish Moss Trail in Beaufort, this is a recent rail-to-trail uh, conversion. and. Uh, most of it's like you know classic low country marshland scenery, but then you run past or you walk past this building. Well, this this building is the so-called pickle factory. It's the Seacoast Packing Company's old old, uh, old uh, factory, I guess. And and you look at it, you're just endlessly fascinated, not just with the the architecture of the building, but also the graffiti, and uh, not just on the outside, but on the inside. It's just uh, I just I saw this and I fell in love with this building. And, and I decided to make it uh, one of the levels in the game. So this is going to be one of the bonus stages in the game. The Seacoast Packing Company, also known as the Pickle Factory. Uh, Ufert has an Art Deco jail from way back in the day. And uh, it is no longer being used. And it kind of looks like it could be a perfect new location for a haunted house. And, I, and when I saw that building, I'm like, that building needs to be in a video game. And uh, so we're going to make that a level in the game. The old Art Deco jail. And uh, if you've been up to St. Helena Island, you've probably seen these praise houses. These were uh, small structures that were created on plantations to allow, well, during slavery, they, during slavery, they were a place where slaves could get together and, and worship essentially freely and hold meetings and, and, and that sort of thing. And they continued to be used for that purpose after slavery had ended. Many of them have, uh, you know, decayed or have otherwise, you know, been destroyed. But there's a few that are still standing, and this one is over near uh, Eddings Point on St. St. Helena Island. And so this actually will be the this is the tutorial level in the game. This is the first house you encounter in the game. So, but this Bugs and Boohacks was not the, the game we originally set out to make. I was originally envisioning a game that fell into the supernatural thriller um, survival horror genre. Like, what would happen if you took a game like Alan Wake? Or Silent Hill, or Resident Evil, and had it take and set that game in Buford, where the Boo Hack would be one of the major villains in the game. By now, you've been staring at this image for a while, and you're probably wondering, okay, what's up with this? Okay, what is up with this image from Back to the Future 2? Well, I'll I'll tell you, my interesting friends, exactly what the purpose of this image is. You may remember the scene where Marty in the year 2015. Okay, he goes to this place called Cafe 80s, and uh, he's waiting for Griff Tannen for his confrontation with Griff Tannen, and he just happens to look over his shoulder and he sees uh, this game that doesn't really exist, but this arcade game called Wild Gunman, and he goes and plays the game, and, and, uh, and that guy pays off a little bit later in the story. Well, in, in my game, the original game that we had in mind, uh, I had this idea that our main character, the hero, as part of his journey, would be exploring the city of Buford and even find himself in an old convenience store. And as he's wandering through this convenience store, he sees this dusty old arcade game called Bugs and Boo Hags sitting in the back. And he 
inquires with the store owner, like, what's up with this? He's like, oh, this was a huge hit back in the day. You want me to fire it up for you? And so your character plays this game, Bugs and Boo Hags, and discovers basically how to defeat the Boo Hag, and it drives the narrative forward. So Bugs and Boo Hags was always meant to be a game within this much bigger game, but as I started developing the pixel art for the game and, and started, you know, conceptualizing what would Bugs and Boo Hags that game be like, it just kind of took on a life of its own, and that's basically, that was basically our first project. And that's the one that we're close to finally completing. If you get a chance, come to the Indie Game Arcade. We have uh, a demo of, of Bugs and Boo Hags there for people to play. Well, let's get back to our supernatural slash survival horror and Buford idea. How would one actually execute an idea like this? Especially considering that it's just me and Candace working on this game right now. You know, we don't have a AAA sized team. We don't have millions of dollars at our disposal. How, are we, how would we pull off a game like Silent Hill in Buford? And how would we make our game special and not just a retread of, of, of uh, these you know, tropes and themes that we've seen time and time again? Well, for starters, you know, they say write what you know. And Candace is a trained screenwriter and storyteller, and, and so she made sure that, you know, Brian, you know, whoever your main characters are going to be, make sure your main character, make sure people are going to have empathy for your main character, but also make sure you have empathy for your main character. And so, I came up with the main character with, with whom I can identify. So after some consultation with the folks from the University of South Carolina Center for Digital Humanities in Columbia, I worked with Candace to uh, come up with a story where the main character is like me, an academic. An academic who shows up in a new place, feels like fish out of water. An academic who is, you know, for all intents and purposes, good at his craft, but is constantly feeling like a fraud. An academic who's good at what he's trained to do, but uh, is forced to reckon with what he might be born to do. And so for these and a variety of reasons, which I don't really want to give away, um, Candace and I decided to call our game The Imposter Syndrome. And here's one possible elevator pitch uh, for the game that I'll share with you today. Southern Gothic, science fiction, and magical realism collide in this supernatural thriller set hundreds of years into the future. In a world, I mean, in a seaside town where everyone looks alike, thinks alike, and has long forgotten their cultural heritage, a new professor plagued by self-doubt and lack of faith is forced to embrace his innate food of powers when his South Carolina island community is mysteriously overrun with strange creatures possessed by demonic human spirits. I told you many more to get too much of the plot away. So that's the gist of the story. It's going to be, we're envisioning an action-oriented science fiction game with a twist of Southern Gothic and magical realism. Now what would the design of that game look like? Well, we're big fans of, well, let me step back a bit. What our main character's goal is to reclaim his heritage. He happens to be descended from, uh, from the Gullah people of that area of South Carolina. He just doesn't know what he's doing in the game. He finds this out later in the game. And so part of your quest is to reclaim your character's Gullah heritage. And so we were thinking it would be cool for the game to have a distinctly Gullah look and feel. If you're, if you're all familiar with folk art, uh, or, or Gala art, you might be familiar with Sam Doyle's works, or perhaps Jonathan Green, the artist. Well, Candace and I are big fans of the work of Amiri Ferris, who's an immensely prolific artist uh, who uses a combination of printmaking, found objects, and traditional painting to create these multimedia depictions of life in the sea islands. His work has been exhibited nationally, including at the opening of the Smithsonian National African American National Museum of African American History. We want the game to actually look like Amiri's paintings brought to life as an interactive medium. So as we're you know getting ready to you know pitch the game to um, perhaps funding agencies, that sort of thing, we, we want to we want to at least have a visual concept of what the game might look like. So, if you need some concept art, and you want your, your, your characters and your the scenery to look like an Amiri Ferris painting, then who do you call to your concept art? How about Amiri Ferris? Well, 
he just happened to be available. And so he uh, was willing to, you know, for a small commission, um, was willing to create some character concepts for us. And so what you see over there on the, on the left is, uh, is your character. Your character is, is uh, Jed DuBose. And he starts off the game as a bit of a straight-laced academic, and then he progresses through the game to reclaim his goal heritage, and he starts to take on more of the appearance of, well, I guess the best way to describe it might be if the, if the, if the Gullah community was a lot like the, uh, the Jedi Order, okay? This is a video game, right? Uh, this, this might be what our hero would look like and how he would dress. And, and that might give you a clue about the kinds of powers that, uh, that he might have. Again, it's a video game. So, in addition to uh, Jen, we've got some of the other main characters in the game, and we've got, this is probably my personal favorite of the bunch. This is, uh, let's just call him the, the king of the palmetto bugs, the, the yeah. king cockroach. And uh, it's uh, quintessentially a Miri Ferris. He, he does a lot of depictions of things like crabs and lobsters in, in many of his paintings for seafood festivals. And so this, uh, this was kind of easy for him to, to do if he wanted to create this strange creature. But, uh, so I, I really enjoyed that. But, uh, so those are the character concepts we have, but we also needed some scenery. And uh, we did get some seed funding from the University of South Carolina to start um, building a game design document, maybe, do, maybe doing a little bit of prototyping. And so I took some of the funding that I had, and I, I uh, had one of my students, uh, Brian Bartoff, a computational science student at USCB, uh, help to, he, he used Blender to create this uh, really faithful rendition of the uh, Buford Arsenal, this is where the Buford History Museum currently is, in downtown Buford. And uh, if you're not familiar with the structure, okay, that's a photograph of it. And as you can see, uh, Brian really did a good job of making sure that not only the architecture was correct, but also the texturing uh, was correct. So uh, this is a, a student who basically was, well, he, he was taking a class, you know, not a scout student, right? Um, and I, I thought his work was pretty remarkable. And, uh, and just for effect, we just happen to have a depiction of the Buford Arsenal in one of Amiri Ferris's own works as well. And so that, uh, that brings us to this uh, pre-visualization 3D composite that I put together in Photoshop. So I took Amiri's painting and flipped it and uh, gave it a fog effect. It kind of looked like it was, you know, kind of like a silent hill thing. And uh, took some of Amiri's character art and tried to form something that looked like a third-person over-the-shoulder view uh, combat scene that, that, that you might find in, say, Resident Evil 4 or, or games of that genre. Um, and so, like, I, I think this is, I think this is very effective. But again, you know, can we really afford to make a game that actually looks like this? And and so, what we're thinking right now is that we might uh, do the game as sort of a 2.5D game, where we can still continue to use some of the 3D assets that we have available to us, uh, but um, it's it'll just be much easier for us to handle in terms of of the mechanics of creating the game. And so, what I'm going to show you here is it's not it's not terribly fleshed out. It's it's very experimental, but it's just a chance for you to see like how some of these assets that Amiri and Brian created might integrate to form something that looks like a level from a video game. So that's what I'm going to show you here. Visualizing what the game might look like if uh, if we want to make this game look more like a Metroidvania style game, like a, I think Waka Melee, a game influenced by Mexican folklore, or maybe you're familiar with Glory in the Blind Forest. Um, so uh, 
So that's our pre-visualization composite as well as, uh, you know, not even a level, but just something to give you a flavor of where we might go in terms of the, the game's design. And that's the imposter syndrome, at least insofar as how, what the, how the game itself is concerned, the game play. But there's more to the imposter syndrome than game play. I'm really interested in games that, uh, that catalyze the learning process. They don't have to be educational games for the sake of it being educational. Winston Churchill was once quoted as saying, I love to learn, but I don't necessarily like being taught. Okay? And if you played any educational games, you might, be, you might have to remember that, oh, these, they're very heavy-handed in terms of how they get their message across. And that's not what we're trying to do here. But we do want people to be educated. We do want to promote uh, the player's education about the source material on which the game is based. Gullet culture, for example. And so, what we're going to do is have, um, as you make your way through the game, you're going to unlock uh, achievements, and your rewards for uh, achieving, saying getting through a level, will be unlocking this, these series of mini documentaries that are roughly two to three minutes long, that just offer a little bit of a, like an interview with uh, somebody from the Gala community, or somebody who's got some expert knowledge about, uh, about the material. And uh, this was actually used in great effect in a game called Never Alone, which came out a couple years ago. It's for pretty much every PC and console out there now. Uh, but this was a game that explored the Inupiat uh, tribe of northern Alaska, and it was intended to promote cultural awareness of, of that area and their beliefs. And so we really liked that, and we decided to, to run with it. And we've created uh, a couple, what we call unlockumentaries, unlockable documentaries that uh, will be revealed uh, to the player and they can watch it at their leisure. They don't have to watch it to progress through the game. They can just watch it at their leisure and learn a little bit about uh, some of the source material. So what I'm going to show you here is uh, the first of these. This features uh, Victoria Smalls, who herself is Gala. She was um, most recently the Director of Marketing and Development for the Penn Center, uh, which is now part of the National uh, Reconstruction Landmark that Obama declared uh, not, not that long ago. Um, she's now with the International African American Museum in Charleston, but if you watch AMC, uh, you might have seen that show, Ride with Norman Reedus. Have anybody seen that show? Okay, maybe a couple of you have. Well, if you get a chance to watch, uh, watch the episode from like, probably about a month ago, where Norman Reedus and David Chappelle ride motorcycles from Charleston to Beaufort, and, and they stop uh, at, the, at the Penn Center, and they talk with Victoria Smalls, and, and what I really appreciated was how favorably the Gullah community was painted. Uh, it, it, it was painted in such a favorable light, and, and done with such good production value uh, that uh, you know, AMC and their budget can provide. Can we do this on a shoestring budget ourselves? Well, I'll let you be the judge. So let's hear from Victoria. My realization of Gullah language and Gullah culture didn't come until 19 in the 90s, which is really unfortunate. You're living this Gullah life, but you're not knowing that you are Gullah or, and we didn't even use that word Gullah, we used Geechee at that time. So when I spoke, people would laugh at me. And then I became quiet, as I said. And then, I started watching the nightly news and started correcting my speech because people were laughing at me because they thought I was not intelligent. So the Gullah language is so much more than that. It's so much more. It comprises of more than 5,000 words within the West African tribal languages. Not just one country, but all of them. So during that little passage, everyone's trying to communicate when they're trying to come over. Find out where they're going, where their families are, what's going to happen to them. And so they're all communicating. And so also the slave traders were also trying to communicate with the captured people. And so you have that, that English, melded with the West African tribal languages, creolized into the Bell language. Some of the signifiers that you will hear people say, if they come from a Gullah community, if they are influenced in any way by the Gullah language, or if they are Gullah, you'll hear them say, dem, dad, dare. Um, when there's words like heaven, we'll remove the V and put a B, it'll be heaven. Um, door, there'll be no R on the end, we remove the R, it's don't, low. Um, but dem, 
Dad, dare you take off the TH at the beginning of those and you put a D. So when you hear those things, someone is better around some Bella folk, someone comes from a Bella community, or they are Bella in fact. And what happened with me when I became silent and I started watching the, I started watching the nightly news to correct my speech. And I watched Walter Cronkite, of all people. And and I started correcting myself. And what happened was I started to stutter for about, I used to, I used to thought I was about nine years, but in actuality it was about five years I stuttered. And only this year I realized why I was stuttering. Because that little Bella girl wanted to come out. And I was stuttered only on a few words, on the words the, that, and them, those TH words. I was stuttered on. And that little Bella girl was trying to say duh. That, dead. And I didn't realize that until this year, until 2016. I did not realize all these years. I was wondering why I was stuttering. So it wasn't really a stutter. It was me suppressing my gullet. And it wanted to come out so badly that it was painful. But those are the signifiers of the gullet language. So this, uh, this unlockumentary might be revealed to the player um, at some point in the game where in the beginning of the game everybody's speaking basically English, but as our main character and by proxy the, the surrounding community starts to reclaim their Gullah heritage, you might, you might hear some more of the, of the Gullah language being spoken in the game. Um, Another one of these optical documentaries features Andy Tate, who you might recognize as, uh, well, he, he and his wife, Bernice, are prolific artists in, in the community, and uh, he's, he's all about educating the community about Gullah culture, about hoodoo and conjuration and, and whatnot, and he does this uh, series of monologues where he dresses up as Dr. Buzzard and uh, just telling a series of stories as if, as if Hol his own version of how Holbrook uh, interpreting Mark Twain, and I think you'll enjoy this. Now, I want to give y'all my very personal account of some strange goings on right here in Beaufort County, South Carolina, about the past, the present, and the future. Who did conservation and root work is real. You know, there was a time when who had to evil spirits as well as crazy wild out of control all over Beaver County. Nobody knows how damn many there was, but they was mixed in throughout all our communities. They look like us, they walk like us, they act like us. They were just like one of us. And I'm talking about the all of us, not just the folks who look like me, in case you're wondering. <laughs> You know what strange feeling it gets sometimes when certain folks show up, they come around, that uneasiness you get that you just can't put your, you can't put your finger on. <laughs> you know, you know, it's the evil spirit and, and the devil coming out of some of these folks. <laughs> you know, what you need to understand is that there was a time when we root doctors uh, was the only health care source for our folks. Uh, we root doctors were also the only protection against the uh, evil spirits as well. I mix all my root medicine from scratch, you know, uh, using local roots and herbs, bugs, things that crawl and creep in the woods. I use things right out the kitchen too. So, Heaven. and so on. And sometimes I have to make a little, a special run to the outhouse for certain sounds or things. <laughs> I'm just saying that. <laughs> so if you want to leave here in your right mind, it needs to understand there's two simple rules that you've got to know about. Rule number one, there ain't no rules. <laughs> you know, sometimes you just gotta follow your own mind. You don't let nobody turn you around. You never know what you can get away with until you try. <laughs> so, you do something every day that scares the hell out of you. <laughs> and don't worry about those folks who, who don't understand. You know, you know the ones who always talk bad about you behind their back when you 
not a frown. The ones that pretend they black you and always gonna smile them all up in your face like you don't know what the hell is going on. <laughs> you know who I'm, you know who they are. Just just them be people alone. Don't mess with them. Because there's always gonna be somebody who will be jealous and never like anything that you do. So don't be afraid to piss people off. <laughs> Anyway, so that pretty much wraps up the presentation. Um, let me just finish up by saying, love it if you would like and follow Bugs and Boo Hacks on Facebook to keep apprised of uh, some of the further developments in the game. Um, if, and please come by the Indie Game Arcade to play uh, the game in demo. So far, nobody's been able to beat it. I have some special merchandise to give away for anybody who can make it through all of the demo levels. Um, and if you like the game before, if you like our page on Facebook before February 3rd, I'll give you a free copy of, of the game demo. And we'd like to uh, use Facebook and uh, so on called Snapchat and, and, and the other you know, forms of social media that the kids like uh, to promote our uh, forthcoming Kickstarter campaign where some of the donor awards will include things like game merchandise, the usual stuff, game merchandise, exclusive access to the game before the general public, as well as getting over to credit to the back or producer. But here's a special incentive. Um, at the higher tiers, we're thinking about ha uh, creating custom level designs based on at least on your own home. Right? And so as an example, well, I know this is not your house. This is the Robert Smalls house in downtown Beaufort. But uh, uh, I, spent, I spent a considerable amount of time over the winter break uh, making my own pixel art versions of some of the historic homes in Beaufort. And I've, I've gotten it down to a science. So uh, if you're willing to, you know, uh, help, help support the game, then we can make sure that uh, you're, you're not just listed in the credits, that uh, you have more material contribution than that. So, um, people I want to thank, all of you for being here, Victoria Smalls, Bernice and Andy, um, mom and uh, my sister, mom being mom, of course, but also being an early financial contributor to the game. My sister did all the music for Bugs and Who Hacks. She used it combination of Pulse Boy and Tama Tracker to create some authentic chip tune music for the game. Our folks at Digital Community, uh, Center for Digital Communities at USC, and Amiri Ferris, of course. Mike Switzer for some early on-air coverage on NPR. Uh, you've heard Gazette, Local Packet, most recently Local Life, and I've been Head, gives press coverage, and uh, other people that I've worked with uh, over the past several years. And, um, and that's it, so thank you very much for your attention. Happy to take any questions. So I apologize, I came in a little late, but is the Kickstarter campaign to fund the development team or the proceeds? We're trying to get seed funding to uh, get more prototyping done for, we want well, to finish Bugs and New Hacks, of course, but we're hoping that some of that, some of those that funding can be used to help um, use the catalyze the development of the Impossible Syndrome uh, game as well. Um, so it's, it's kind of all means to an end because the, the two projects are so closely intertwined. But we're looking to launch that Kickstarter sometime later this month. Good. 
<clears throat> Dr. Canada, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you all. I just love having a smartphone. I love getting the instant news with all the other stuff that's been going on today. BuzzFeed just announced a very attractive 22 year old woman who's been missing in California since November has been located. She's currently a contestant on The Bachelor. Thank you very much for attending and our next presentation will be